All right, let's get acquainted with RFID theory of operation, especially looking at the EM4001 transponder bitstream and the ID12LA transceiver, especially with its UART output. This is the RFID reader that's included in the NIMIRIO embedded systems kit. It's by ID Innovations, called the ID12LA. This breakout board is required to convert the 2 millimeter pin spacing of this reader to 10th inch format for breadboards. Your kit also includes two RFID tag cards, and these are shaped just like credit cards, thin plastic, and I'll take a high intensity LED source here, common flashlight, shine that through the plastic, and let's see what we can find. All right, inside we see the loop antenna and that connects to our transponder chip over here. And with those two structures in mind, let's take a look at the underlying theory of RFID. Now the transponder, probably more commonly known as the tag or RFID tag, contains the antenna that we just saw, that loop antenna, and contains a power supply of some sort. You have a, either the option of a passive tag or a battery powered tag. In the case of a passive tag, it actually obtains power from its antenna. There's no battery inside. We have a either read only or read write memory. And then we have a modulator. This is the mechanism for transmitting that stored information back out to the transceiver. Transceiver, more commonly known as a reader, contains a similar collection of components. It has an antenna, it has an oscillator for setting up an AC magnetic field. It has a demodulator for picking up that bitstream from the transponder. And it has some sort of standard microcontroller interface. For example, a UART style output. Now I'm still keeping the discussion fairly general, but some of the numerical values will be specific to the EM4001 standard. Here's the sequence of events. The transceiver periodically activates its antenna with a 125 kHz sine wave. When a transponder is close enough, it actually soaks up some energy from the transceiver. That powers the transponder, and the transceiver can actually detect that the transponder is nearby. The transponder in turn reads its memory and then modulates the loading on its own antenna to transmit the bitstream. We say that the transceiver feels, so to speak, this change in loading and that's how it recovers the bitstream. Now here at the reader, we use a sinusoidal source to activate the loop antenna, and that develops a time-varying magnetic field. When that field intercepts the loop antenna of the transponder, that induces a corresponding voltage. We say that these two coils are coupled together by mutual inductance. Now earlier I said that the transceiver can feel what's happening on the other side. Well, if we use a switch to alternately change the loading on that transponder coil, then that change in loading can be felt back at the transceiver. And that's how we communicate from transponder back to the reader. Now let's look at the EM4001 standard. This is equivalent to a number of other subsequent devices. This is based on a 64-bit transfer total with a 32-bit payload of unique identification. We use 8 bits for a version number or custom ID, and then we have 40 bits total. V again means the version number, D for our data bits. Now how do we get 64? Well, we add 9 header bits, all 1. This is what the transceiver uses to synchronize the bit, bit timing. Manchester encoding is used because it's a self-clocking technique. Then, every four bits of data, we insert an even parity bit. Parity is used for error detection. Here's how even parity would work. Supposing these were my four bits, I would count the number of ones that I have, and if it's odd, then I add an extra one to make it an even number total. In this case, we already had an even number of bits that are one, so the parity would be zero. We insert these parity bits every four bits then for that 40-bit message. Finally, we have four column parity bits, come back to that in a second, and then a single stop bit, which is zero. All together, if you count that up, we have 64 bits. 
Let's look at the column parity bits again. If I take these collection of groups of four bits and arrange them in a vertical fashion like this, and then do the even parity calculation going column-wise, that's where we get the four column parity bits. These are also even parity. And again, all of these parity bits are inserted to help the reader do some error detection. Now let's consider the ID12LA reader, especially the UART output. The reader will develop an output stream of 16 ASCII characters, and here's how it does it. I'm using zero little x to indicate hexadecimal notation. The reader first generates a start of text ASCII character, that is hexadecimal 02. Then every four bits are presented as an ASCII character and an ASCII printing character. Let me show you how. Here's the 16 possible bit combinations. This is what they would look like if written out in hexadecimal. And then a printing version of zero would look like hexadecimal three zero as an ASCII character. The printing version of one would look like this, and etc., all the way down to numerical value nine. Skip a couple of values and then capital A is represented as hexadecimal 41 through capital F at hexadecimal 46. I'll just use capital V to indicate that you're inserting two ASCII characters for the version number. The same process is repeated with our 32-bit ID and we end up with eight ASCII characters Next, the ID12LA inserts two ASCII characters representing a checksum. I'll come back to that in a second. Then it follows it up with a cares return, hexadecimal 0D, and then a line feed, hexadecimal 0A. And finally, it finishes the message by transmitting the ASCII end of text character, hexadecimal 03. Now, this is the complete set of 16 characters that are transmitted each time the tag is brought close to the reader. You'll see here that we have a total of 12 printing ASCII characters. Now, let me show you an example to help make sure this is clear. I'll be drawing all my values in hexadecimal format here. Now, 36 hex is the printing character 6. This is the printing character capital A. And we can start to realize that the numerical values begin with three and the letters begin with four. We have D and then F. And then there's the carriage return, line feed, etc. Now the checksum is df. Let's see how that checksum is calculated. What you want to do is add all of the other values in binary without any carries. Again, this is more clear as, as a specific example, I think. Here's the hexadecimal values, and then I'll write those out in binary. Do the same thing for the remaining values. Now add each one of these column-wise without doing any carries from one column to the next. There's four, so that would be one zero. There's three. Again, I discard the, the one in front of that. There's three again, describe, discarding the one. And those, we just have one. All right, this is hexadecimal D, and this is hexadecimal F. And sure enough, that matches the checksum that was generated by the reader. So what you want to do is calculate the checksum and then compare to the transmitted checksum, and they need to match. If they don't, you've detected a, a transmission error. All right, to wrap things up, let's take a look at the signal description for the ID12LA reader. It has 11 pins total. Here's the power supply connections, pins 1 and 11. VDD can be anywhere from 2.8 up to 5.0 volts. 
pin 9 designated as D0 signal name. That's our UART transmitter output. It uses 9600 baud, 8 bits, no parity, and one stop bit. Format select, that's number 7. We need to have format select connected to ground to make a UART style output. This reader can also emulate a magnetic hard swipe reader. It's important that we specify the UART version though. Pin 6, tag and range. This is active high signal. It also includes a 3.3 kilo ohm resistor if you'd like to drive it, drive an LED directly. But that's the thing that tells us that we've got a transponder in range. Pin 10 generates a 3.3 kilohertz square wave tone burst, and you can also either connect that to a buzzer or connect it to an LED. Pin 2 is the reset. Just go ahead and connect that to VDD permanently. Here's some no connects. CP stands for card present, but this is only useful if you're using something other than the UART mode. D1 is also a UART transmit, but it's an inverted version of the one that we need for D0. These highlighted connections then are the ones that you want to use for the UART output style.